Hi, I'm John Rosentrader, director of the Sarasota National Cemetery, and you're watching Tampa Bay Community Network. Hi, I am Bill Hodges and this is Spotlight on Government. And today I want you, if you have a veteran in the family and they're close enough where you can go, hey, come in and watch this, I want you to bring them in to watch it. If you're a person who is a veteran, spouse of a veteran, daughter or son, or relative of a veteran, then you need to sit and watch this too. Because our guest today is John Rosentrader. John is the director of the National Cemetery in Sarasota. John, how great for you to be here. Well, I'm just very happy to be here with you today, Bill. You know, I have to tell you quickly, we went down and spent the day with John two days ago and went through the cemetery and looked at it, and I was mightily impressed, John. Well, we want it to be a shrine to our veterans and their service, and so I was really glad to be able to give you a little quick tour of it, and I'm glad that it's uh, meeting your uh, desire uh, for a cemetery for our veterans. Well, you know what? <laughs> I have to tell you, both Phyllis and I had thought, well, when we go, we'll be cremated and dumped in the bay, which, by the way, is illegal. You have to take yourself, I don't know, four miles offshore or something, <laughs> but a whole lot of them get dumped in the bay. But beside that, I got to thinking after I looked at that facility, I think that's where I want my home to be. Well, we certainly have uh, cremation. Many people say to me when, I, when we're doing outreach, I say, uh, you know, do you, are you familiar with your burial benefits? And I say, oh, I don't, I don't need it. I'm going to be cremated. Well, actually, <laughs> at the National Cemetery, we can accommodate cremains. In fact, in more than one way. Right. 70% of our burials are cremation, and we can either place them in ground in a four foot by four foot gravesite with a full upright marble headstone, or we have a columbarium, which is a wall uh, with niches. I think uh, we've got some pictures of that. Yeah. So that's, yeah. So we have those options. We even go in even a little bit further what your original thought was of going four miles off the coast and having your remains scattered in the Gulf, which is a very popular here. Uh, when I was at the Fort Logan National Cemetery, the Rocky Mountain National Park is also a very popular place. What I'm saying is when a veteran or their spouse or dependent child is uh, remains are scattered, we have what we call a memorial wall. And it has the same type of niche plate as our columbaria does, oh, but there's okay. nothing behind it. So it's the same size of marble niche. And there it will always say, in memory of. That is so cool. Now, I thought it was interesting, the size of the niches, as you call them, on that wall. We've got pictures and engravings and everything. Right. Is what? Uh, yeah, so the niche is nine and a half inches wide. 12 inches tall, and then 18 inches deep. So depending on the size of the urn, you could fit six urns in there if you had to, but it very easily accommodates two urns for a husband and wife, per se. What criteria would allow us to have more than a husband and wife in there? Well, it would, it would be a tragedy, of course, where the um, children, possibly, uh, and the family were all uh, killed in a car accident or something like that. The children under the age of 21 are all eligible for interment oh, really? in the National Cemetery. So it's, what it is, it's so the So one of the spouses is a military veteran. The children under 21 also have the right to be buried in the National Cemetery? Yes, so it's the veteran, the spouse, and dependent children up to the age of 21, or actually it goes all the way to 23 if they're in an accredited college. You know, families as they are today, there's, you see somebody hit their 60th wedding anniversary or 70th, 
and you think, wow, because a lot of us don't make that many. And they have a wife, that wife dies, and if that wife dies before the veteran, mm -hmm. now what happens? Yeah, so th and that is even a dependent child. Uh, a dependent child may pass away. So if that happens, uh, the headstone, let's just, we'll just talk about an in-ground casket burial with a okay. dependent child or spouse. The upright, full upright headstone would be inscribed. It would either have the spouse or the dependent child's information, and then it would say either son or daughter of, or wife of, or husband of, and then the veteran's information underneath. So that is an often time question, often asked question is, what if my spouse predeceases me, and that's not a problem at all? Then when the veteran passes away, uh, a whole new headstone is inscribed with only the veteran's information on the front of the headstone, and then the spouse's information would then be placed, or the dependent child would be on the back of the headstone. Okay, now there is something I think kind of interesting here that you shared with us the other day. A lot of times a spouse will die the veteran will have them put into the cemetery. And then they'll think, well, you know, I'm not going to remarry. But they do. Yes. All of a sudden, there's wife number two. And when he passes or she passes, what do you do with those? So, especially if it's a cremation, uh, there is room in that four foot by four foot cremation site to easily place two spouses and the veteran or three spouses and the veteran and, and there's room on the back of the headstone to take care of all of the spouses. So yes, as long as uh, the spouse is married to a veteran at either the time of the veteran's death or at the time of their death, they are eligible. I know the questions get complicated, but they're spinning around in my head, and I'm sure our viewers are thinking too. Let's say that you do have a spouse die. You put her in a cemetery, in the National Cemetery, in your spot, and then you die, but you've remarried, and your new wife says, I don't want him with her. He's got to be with me. Can she get him a new spot, or is nope. he stuck? Yep, he'll be using the, spot, the grave space that was uh, reserved for him, really, when his spouse passed away. So they all will use the, it's, it's kind of one veteran, one grave site. One grave site. Now, so. the only thing that changes that is with our pre-placed crypts. A pre-placed crypt, which is for our casketed burial, only will take two caskets, so that's all you can do. So. One example to easily explain that is, let's say a dependent child predeceases the parents, or we've even had uh, military couples have a child that has passed away, buried somewhere else in the country. They are now uh, settling in Sarasota or the Tampa area, and they ha decide to have that child disinterred and placed in our Sarasota National Cemetery. At that time, there would be the grave site where the child is, and then we would set aside another grave site for either the veteran or the spouse. So one is more than likely going to share the grave with the dependent child, and then the other would have a grave site Separate. right next to it. Because there's, we know if it goes as planned, there will be three burials, and so therefore we have to set aside the grave. Nothing is easy, is it? Right, but we do. You know I was going to hit you with all those questions, but you always have an answer, John. <laughs> well, prior to our pre-placed crypts, uh, they would actually have to dig the grave down to nine feet and place the first concrete liner down to that. Then the second would go at seven feet. Then the third would go at five feet. So, so the pre-placed crypts have made it much better for us as, as cemetery maintenance because of that concrete liner only being two feet under the soil, we don't suffer with sunken graves like you would if you disturbed that soil all the way down to nine feet. You know, that, that's interesting. I think that we don't really have any good pictures of that. But as I understand it, and see if I'm correct, when a grave site, a whole field, is prepared, they put the crypts in for each of the graves 
For yes, for instance, and bury them all at once. When the Sarasota National Cemetery uh, was developed, they buried over 11,000 pre-placed crypts for our casketed section. Now, of course, for our cremation in-ground section, there's nothing no, because that, right, right, we simply uh, dig a grave and place the urn in the in the soil there. And that that's kind of cool because those crypts are all seven feet deep, correct? Right. The box. Two feet. Yeah, the, you're absolutely right. That's exactly right. Seven feet because the crypt itself is five feet deep, and yes, it's and two it feet will, under soil. It will contain two graves or two two caskets. And how it does that is the first casket is lowered to the bottom. Then there's a shelf, and then the second casket sets on top of that shelf. And then they just put the lid back down, put the lid back so on. they can mm -hmm. they can open or close it as they need to to yes. either take out or add. That's correct. Makes it a lot easier all the way around. It is much easier. And we, as you know, Florida is very much a transient state. And even um, and after soggy. death, <laughs> well, even after death, uh, caskets or cremains are disinterred. Possibly, let's just say, veteran and spouse have retired here in Florida. Family still lives up north somewhere. One, either the veteran or the spouse has passed away, the family wants the remaining to go up there with them. Sometimes that spouse wants to take their spouse's remains with them and are buried okay. then. So that's a disinterment for our part, and they can reinter in a national cemetery close to them or in a private cemetery. It's their choice. Let's talk about, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's talk about who is eligible to be buried in a national cemetery. Right, so it is the veteran and spouse and dependent children up to the age of 21, or as I said, 23 if it's in continuing education, or if an adult dependent child. An adult dependent child, again, would have to be that same either 21 years or if they're in college, 23, that they have medical records that they are either mentally or physically handicapped for the rest of their life and are dependent upon that veteran and their spouse to care for them and that a lot of times is never had a, would not be able to have a, carry a job, would not be married, uh, those types of things, totally dependent upon the veteran and their spouse, then they too would be eligible for the rest of their life. I have a friend in that situation, and I don't, he is a uh, warrant officer and retired, mm -hmm. and they have a child that's like that. Yes. And I'm not sure that they're even aware of that. I'm going to have to make sure they watch this. Well, and absolutely. And now let me just say the only documentation that they need is, of course, the veteran's discharge paper. That's what makes everyone eligible that is eligible. But also a doctor's statement. A doctor's statement would need to be written and saying that prior to this age, this either this disease or this... Um, ailment took place causing them to be dependent and then that's that's the only documentation that's needed well I'm wondering is there a way to handle all that ahead of time put it on file with the cemetery uh, well there is the best thing to do in any of that is to choose the funeral home or crematorium of your choice and then give them that letter give them your discharge papers so that at the time of need uh, then the family member would just simply contact that funeral home or crematorium and then that information would be there. With that being said, that's correct. We do not have pre-registration. Okay. So there's no reservations for graves or anything like that. So the cemetery does not receive paperwork ahead of time to make a reservation. It's all done with the funeral home. Okay, so then they should be sure in their papers because they may pass away before right. he goes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. And so, yes, so that would have to definitely be all handled in their will and in their paperwork. But yes, if they can know ahead of time that they need that doctor's letter and get that taken care of, because what's difficult is when the adult dependent child passes away, and then they're trying to get a letter. Exactly, that's what I'm thinking. Right, and especially if the family lived up north and the doctor that cared for this child all through their, until their adulthood, now maybe may no longer be available. And so it's their doctor down here in Florida that's trying to put that together for them. So but in this instance, the child lives in a group home. Yeah. Uh, they're mentally, has, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 
wonderful, wonderful young man. I just love right. him to death. Right. But he just yeah, he's, a, he's yeah, he's a, a, an adult <clears throat> dependent. So so that wouldn't be too hard. Let's talk about a funeral itself. I noticed when we came in, it said there's a sign that says turn this way if you're going to a funeral. Well, so. so Let's go from there. Turn this way if you're going to a funeral, John. What, what our sign says is all funerals turn right. Okay. And so that's down Army Avenue that will put them into our cortege lanes. So we have seven cortege lanes, about 100 yards long each, that uh, funeral processions can line up in. Then the next of kin comes in and meets with our cemetery representatives, make sure we have the information for the headstone sheet correct, and all the paperwork is signed. Then and there's the, a sign, right? Gives right. The, there is gives a, the, the what funeral it is and what lane they're supposed to be in. That's exactly correct. So let's say you're the Johnson family and we've assigned you to lane E. Uh, you would see Johnson and then you'd see an E at the end. And, and so most of funeral see. homes would know that. Right, but but I'll just say with but 70, it doesn't have to be a funeral home. Exactly, with seventy percent of our. Uh, families choosing cremation, oftentimes a funeral director is not involved when they actually come to the cemetery. Sometimes they are, but some, more times than not. So, or you, so it's like what you're thinking is if you're at a church and you had the funeral, now you're going out to the cemetery for the committal shelter, we all go in procession. But many times family or friends show up apart or they show up by themselves. And so that sign, besides us having a, a uh, Vis a uh, volunteer out front to help greet families to tell them also to make sure they get into the right lane. Now's a good time to talk about volunteers. Well, before that, I do want to say, okay. uh, while, while the sign says all funerals turn right, in reality, what takes place at the cemetery is what would normally be called a graveside service. But because we open up many graves at the same time, right in the same area. Too dangerous. It's too dangerous, so we have committal shelters. And so that's what the cemetery rep is going to lead those families to, is to either committal shelter A or B. That's where the military honors will take place. That's where the clergy, if they desire, or family members will have a short time to talk, about 20 to 30 minutes at the committal shelter, not a full-blown memorial or funeral by any means. Because we, we average, we average 10 to 12 burials a day, and so they only have two shelters, so we are definitely on a schedule. But when you talk about volunteers, uh, yes, our volunteers help inside the office with answering the phones and greeting our guests at the uh, information center, as well as helping uh, direct traffic. Uh, then helping to make sure they get parked correctly and for very large services they make sure that they go out in order then many times they go to the committal shelter and help make sure the cars get parked there we also have volunteers who come and help remove things that are not necessarily authorized to be on the grave site for instance our floral policy says that fresh cut flowers only are allowed uh, except from December 1st through January 10th. So otherwise, we're mowing and trimming nearly every week of the yeah, year. In Florida, it's just right. impossible to not go around all the things. Right. So if we had artificial flowers there all the time, it would just, our maintenance would not be able to be taken care of. So once the flowers become unsightly, then we remove them. I, I think that you could use volunteers for a variety of things, though, correct? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we do. Uh, so so yeah. they should just call the number they see on the screen. Absolutely. Say, I'd like to volunteer. How can I help? And by the way, the two ladies you have answering the phone in your administration mm -hmm. building are two of the nicest ladies that I've ever talked to. Yeah. They really are just very gentle. Well, we, have, we are so fortunate that many of our volunteers have, and I'm not saying it's fortunate to them, but it makes them all the more caring is because they have a loved one that has interred here at the cemetery. And so they have experienced uh, what these family members are oftentimes experiencing for the first time. So it, it makes them uh, very good uh, volunteers in that department. Now, we've got pictures of the committal shelters, mm -hmm. which are very nice. And 
We also, at times, you'll have the military come in and do different things, correct? Yes. But that's up to the person to arrange that, correct? That is correct. So we will, <laughs> of course, assign the grave site and assign which shelter they'll be at. But it is the family's responsibility to arrange for the military honors. And if they want something more than military, such as an American Legion or a VFW uh, rifle fire, uh, that would be up to them to arrange that. If they want clergy to be there to speak, that would be up to them to arrange that. I, I took pictures the other day of some really sharp looking Marines that were going through their paces prior to the funeral showing up. Right. And it was so inspiring to watch these young men all dressed in their you know, dress uniforms. It was just really something. And what you observed was the Marine Corps preparing for a retired uh, Marine uh, burial. And so in that case, the military will oftentimes provide a rifle fire also. Normally, otherwise, if it's less than a 20-year retired veteran, they will provide at least two people to fold the flag and play taps and then issue that flag to the next of kin. Now, if they don't, if the people planning the funeral, the next of kin, don't know how to get in touch with someone like that, mm -hmm. would your office be able to share information and put them in touch with the local legion or whoever it is that does it? Yes, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, we get what you we do. You don't arrange it, but you can. Tell we don't them arrange it, but we do give them the phone number to the fax number and the phone number for each branch of the service, whichever one they may need. Now, as far as the VFW or American Legion, if their uh, veteran was not associated with one, and so therefore they don't know, we can give them suggestions of different ones in Venice or Sarasota or Manatee County. I thought it was also interesting, they did have a bugler there, but you were saying that buglers are kind of hard to come by, and tell them about the mechanical bugles. Well, so what they have, when I started 15 years ago with NCA, we did not have this yet, and uh, many people don't necessarily like it, but they, what they have gone to is the military has a bugle with, a, with an electronic insert. And so they press the button and hold the bugle to their lips, and then it plays taps, which is a recording. But let's say you want to have a live bugler, and you don't have a family member, and the military doesn't have a bugler that they can provide. There's someone called Reese, I'm sorry, Buglers Across America. Okay. And bu you could just Google bu uh, Buglers Across America. They're all volunteers, and you go on that website, request the time and date that you need a bugler. And many times we have a bugler that I'm not familiar with, but when I ask them, they say, yes, I'm with the, uh, res uh, with the uh, bugles across America. Well, that's really neat. And remember, if you play an instrument like a bugle mm -hmm. or a trumpet, mm -hmm. maybe you want to get a hold of this group because you could volunteer to do that, right. which I would do if I still had a good lip for a <laughs> trumpet, <laughs> right. which I don't. That's me too. I played in high school, but no longer, so yes. Now, we also have there something that I think is unique at this particular cemetery, is we have a really nice meeting area, an amphitheater, if you will. Yes, that is exactly correct. Every national cemetery has what we call a flag assembly area. And usually there's some type of stage or whatever that a program, especially for Memorial Day, can take place. But uh, when the cemetery was first opening, and again, the cemetery opened for um, its first burial on January 9th, 2009. And so a little bit before that, uh, someone, or actually the president of the Patterson Foundation, stopped by and spoke with our current, at that time, the current uh, director, Miss Sandy Beckley, and that whole pro process began. And when Miss Beckley spoke with them, she said, well, the NCA pretty much plans the entire portion of the cemetery, but what we haven't decided on yet is our flag assembly area. And so in the words of Miss Deborah Jacobs, uh, the chairperson for the Patterson Foundation, they wanted to provide seats and shade. And they did. And they certainly it's did. It's gorgeous. Yes, it really is. Plus uh, all the marble work. 
Right, plus the $2 million worth of commissioned artwork that is also there, as well as bronze uh, eagles that are in it, and the mosaic artwork that's there. So every Tuesday at 10 a.m., if you'd like to come to the cemetery and actually have a guided tour of the artwork, uh, we have trained guides. Oh, wonderful. That are there. It would be worth coming to, believe me. Oh, absolutely. Even every just going down there, you get a real sense of peace. Well, and the thing of it is, the cemetery, while we have 295 acres, only 90 of those acres are developed. And right where the Patriot Plaza is located, if you go for that tour, you really get a very good view of the entire cemetery that has burials taking place. And, and when you walk in, you have the guardian e eagles. That's right. So and on then the, the empty nest on the other yeah, side, the which east, is really symbolic. Yeah, the east entrance is our guardian eagles, and then on the west I'm sorry, I, just the opposite. opposite. The west, west entrance, entrance is the Guardian Eagle. The east entrance is the home uh, with the uh, mantling eagles. John, I've asked you a lot of questions, but I've probably missed some things that you'd like to do. We've got about two minutes. Are there some things that you want to tell us that I haven't asked? Well, sure. I would like to say, uh, just in this area, you really have three opportunities to use a national cemetery. Uh, just 70 miles north of Tampa is Florida National Cemetery in Bushnell, Florida, uh, which is actually the second most active national cemetery in the nation. Really? Uh, with well over 6,000 burials a year. Uh, then right here in St. Petersburg, we have uh, the um, Bay Pines National Cemetery. And currently, they definitely have columbaria, and in-ground cremation burial for cremains. Uh, then, of course, in Sarasota, we have that uh, that can have both casketed burial and cremation burial. Then, over in the Palm Beach area is our South Florida National Cemetery. Then, just recently opened is the Cape Canaveral National Cemetery. Then we have Jacksonville National Cemetery and St. Augustine National Cemetery, as well as Tallahassee. Well, we have about seven here in There's the state. There's nine total nine. now. Now that Tallahassee and Cape Canaveral just opened in the last several years, we now have nine. And then clear in Pensacola is Barrancas National Cemetery. Now, one last question. Ed, what's the charges? to a vet for any of the services you provide? That is an excellent question. Thank you for asking that, Bill. Really, the veteran has already paid for the burial and for their family. So it is a VA benefit that's already been paid for by their service to our country. So the only cost that a veteran or their family members will incur is what they decide with the funeral home or crematorium. But once you come to the National Cemetery, the gravesite, opening, closing, uh, concrete liner around the casket or the full upright marble headstone as well as the in-ground and above-ground cremation burial, the military honors, flag to the next of kin, presidential memorial certificate signed by the current president, and the perpetual maintenance of the gravesite has already been paid for by their wow. service. Wow. You're going to save a spot for me, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. We figure we have burial space till 2065 which should be for over 150,000 veterans and eligible family members. I, I just can't tell you how I felt going through that cemetery. It is a sacred soil. It's a wonderful place to go visit. Go look at it. Take the time to drive through it. If you can't stop for a tour, then just drive through. It doesn't take that long. But it's really, really very peaceful and very pretty. John Rosentrader, I thank you so much for being on the show with me. Uh, I hope you'll come back because oh. I know you've got lots more you could share about the pro the programs there. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting some more pictures and doing a new show. Well, it's a privilege to be here, and thank you for this program so we can get the word out to our veterans because that's so important. Thank you for being with us on Spotlight on Government. John Rosentrader from the National Cemetery in Sarasota has been with us. You're unique, you're special, you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know, and we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. Again, John, thanks for being with me. Thank I you for having it. me. Thank you.